Well, it's really great to be talking to you. This is Brian Whitman that we're with. We're going to be talking about a number of things, and uh, I think a lot of what you have to do is where the artistic world and the technology world come together. So, yeah. Brian Whitman, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paul. I'm really, um, really humbled and, and honored to be on uh, on your show. So you call your your home South Carolina originally, correct? Yeah, I was born and raised in a town called Orangeburg, South Carolina, which is about in the center between Columbia and Charleston, uh, kind of a little off of I-26. Uh, born, born and raised there, uh, went to Orangeburg Wilkinson High School, and then uh, later on went on to uh, the University of South Carolina. So I'm a Gamecock. Okay. Yeah. So have you always been interested in technology? Um, at a young age, my my dad my dad had always dabbled in uh, technology and had different things around the house growing up. Um, computers we had at a young age, um, in like the late '80s, early '90s, and uh, I kind of got my cut my teeth on it through through interaction with things that my dad brought home that he was working on. Um, the family business was a was a tool and die business, and my dad was focused a lot of times on like modernizing that business, bringing in CNC machines and stuff like that, and so. I kind of got to see ground zero of my dad learning about technology as it was becoming more ubiquitous in the, the kind of manufacturing sector. And um, it made me really interested in it uh, as a whole. And then through the 90s, I started um, working at companies and institutions uh, in the Southeast. I, I worked for a hospital kind of doing their like, like helping with the tech support in a town called Bamberg. Uh, I worked for Claflin University, which is like a historically black university out of Orangeburg, helping run their network. Um, so yeah, it was it was something where I kind of it was fostered from a young age through my 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 dad and my parents, and um, I I just uh, was lucky enough to have some opportunities to work in it when I was still a teenager, and that that kind of became um, a big part of my life trajectory through that. So. And so, what about the music side? What was the music that you first fell in love with so from a personal standpoint like a listening standpoint um i was always really into um 70s singer songwriters uh uh growing up the beatles were always like a huge thing that got played around the house paul simon <clears throat> things like this um incidentally my father as well uh, was a guitar player or is a guitar player and um there's a story where I think I was, it was one of my one Christmas in my early teens, I asked for a trumpet. I was interested in the trumpet. And I think I think my parents weren't really interested in me having a trumpet around the house because of the, the, the level of noise. So they got got me a guitar instead, a little uh, three, 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 four Spanish guitar. And uh, that kind of started me on my musical journey of like of learning how to play a guitar, learning how to just do things in music. I started figuring out how to play some of these songs that I, I, I really loved growing up. And then um, that, that's kind of how it all started for me. It was just <laughs> a love of music. And then my, my dad and uh, mom putting, putting a guitar in my hands. Yeah. Well, I want to point everybody in the direction of a website, Seer, and that's Seer.la. And this is a very interesting business that you do. And I want to jump back into the music in just a bit, but cool. I think we should mention Sear because that's kind of how we became connected. Yeah. How, how did Sear get started? Um, fast forward 20 years from my teens to um, uh, about 2010 or 11. Um, and I was, I was in, living in Los Angeles at the time. Um, and started consulting for a company called Legendary Entertainment. I'd had some people that I'd worked in in other capacities um, that worked there that were um, interested in, in launching like a video on demand platform for uh, Nerdist.com and GeekandSundry.com and basically a couple of prop online properties that Legendary owned. Um, and for those not aware, Legendary Entertainment through 2005 on uh, was like a financier slash production company for a lot of really big movies like um, the Hangover franchise they did, like some of the Dark Knight stuff, uh, more recently like the Kong Godzilla Monsterverse stuff that's out there. So really, really kind of cool films, but they had a, di a digital division that 
I was consulting to help them bring, um, bring this video on demand platform to life. And I started consulting there, then went full time, um, and met a couple of other people, uh, within the company that we all kind of share, shared same worldview with technology and some of the things that were going on in the world of AR VR and like what the future might look like there. Um, and some things changed at legendary in 2016, 17. And we all started st talking about starting our own company and, uh, you know, doing, doing this on our own. Uh, we had a lot of, a uh, lot of, uh, connections across the LA area to other studios that had a need, uh, similar to what we were, were looking to do. And that was in, um, video on demand, uh, consulting. So think like, um, any of these uh, studios uh, that needed to be able to bring their content direct to consumer, um, we would help them uh, either stand up fully or fix whatever they had going on. So we were essentially like a video consultancy in Los Angeles for a couple of years. And through that time, we started developing a product that we thought would be interesting in that space to, to help solve some problems that we had as we would uh, work on this technology. Um, and that was the product that that's a product that we have that we we sell out now um, and and um, through that uh, after the pandemic started and how we kind of started to meet was through through the Lyle Levitt and show where uh, you know the beginning of the pandemic Lyle called me and we just started talking at first it was like you know kind of like everybody did we I felt personally convicted to just kind of stay in touch with people that I considered friends and just kind of talking about what was happening. And I think everybody was coping in their own sort of way. And some of the conversations that Lyle and I had started uh, rekindling older conversations that we had had around, um, you know, uh, it had been a couple of years we had been talking about, well, what, what would it be like if, if, uh, if Lyle had a, like a, like a, some sort of show or online consistent thing that, that he did. And, um, that's kind of how that whole conversation started was through the fact that Lyle knew what I was kind of doing. Um, I'd actually just visited him. I, I, since I'm from the Southeast, we drive back and forth, uh, uh, every year for Christmas to be able to spend a little bit more time on the East coast with family. Um, and I had stopped and visited him and, uh, his wife, April and kids, um, on the way back from, um, uh, from South Car from from South Carolina to Southeast uh, when we were going back and it was pre pandemic so it was you know uh, it was in January of 2020 and then a couple of months later we're talking uh, post the pandemic hitting so that's kind of how it all started there but that's how the the connective tissue was was there um, from legendary on to Sear. I have to say the the live stream I saw. In terms of the the <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the quality of the image, the sound, it was just such a. I, I haven't seen any live stream that was as impressive, and and it it really, it was very very good, <laughs> and. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I mean, it, there's a it's a lot of hard work that goes into it, but it's it's also the, the people that are participating, like their their um, their. Uh, kind of eye and, 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 you know, be, it's a, it's something interesting to be able to, to pull off like an actual live, live show remotely in this sort of way. And, and, you know, there's, there's a, a lot that goes into it on the, the tech platform side, but, but, but also the, the participants like Lyle, Lyle and Willis were both, you know, really focused on making sure that they were, they were giving the best possible experience and look and sound that they could. So, um, they're, that's always helpful. And I think a lot of, of the reason why it was good, I'm imagining, is you have a music background, and so you understand about the sound, you understand about the aesthetics of all of this, what people want. I'm hoping you can tell us about, this was very interesting to me, and I've been going through and listening to a lot of the songs from a group, I-9, and so now we're re rewinding a bit. Yeah. <laughs> to tell us about this to, to be signed by Clive Davis. That's quite a thing. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, it almost feels like it didn't happen sometimes, you know, whenever mm. you, you go through certain phases of your life that a lot of things happen all at once. Um, 
it uh, <clears throat> sometimes it feels like a a thing that didn't happen at all. And um, but uh, nonetheless, it, it it did happen. And you know, I'd mentioned that I was at University of South Carolina. Um, I had I've always been um, uh, I've always had like a kind of tight knit group of friends uh, through growing up in Orangeburg. And um, there were a couple of people that always were interested in starting bands and doing doing things uh, with music. And uh, a couple of them, when I was at University of South Carolina, um, we started uh, a band called I-9. And um, we just started recording and kind of doing the things that you do in a in a college band. And we um, I was I was kind of the one that was like, let's let's try to let's try to do something with it. Um, figure out, you know, how, how does this work and how do you, how do you take it to the next level outside of just, um, you know, just kind of playing local, local gigs and clubs. And so I started, um, in the Southeast started looking for, you know, I, I, I realized that one of the things that we were supposed to do is find someone to help record us or find a producer or something like that. And we found one in a, in a gentleman out of Atlanta named, uh, Rick Beato, um, which, through a couple of conversations and, and hanging out, we decided that, you know, post-college we're going to move to Atlanta and um, start kind of taking it a little bit more serious from there. And we'd work on an album and it seemed like the timing was right at the, like at, at that, that point in all of our lives. Um, uh, Brian Gibson and Carmen Keegan's were the, the two uh, friends that I moved to Atlanta with. And we were lucky enough to, uh, we had a friend that was living in Atlanta at the time who was also kind of in this, this this group named Matt Heath who who had a couch that we were able to 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 crash on so um, we went there started recording apologies for the the train in the background <laughs> it's ambience yeah exactly right <laughs> um, <laughs> so um we we moved to Atlanta we started playing gigs in Atlanta um, and we played one gig at a place called Eddie's Attic in Decatur um, we had uh, we'd kind of participated they had like a a singer songwriter uh, open mic shootout thing that they did there every Monday night. Um, and we started playing that and uh, played a couple of gigs there, gigs at Smith's and around the, the Southeast in, ge in general. And one night at Eddie's Attic, we, um, we recorded, uh, Shalom was the sound guy there. And uh, he always had just like really great sounding mixes um, uh, uh, in the room. It was a great listening room, Eddie's Attic. And so we had him record that uh that live performance and then we gave it to our producer and then this started a series of events that was really kind of bizarre and not what we were expecting out of it but we got in a bidding war where we um at first it was people coming down to atlanta where we would play for them in in, in rick our producer's loft um and just play like acoustic so the band's makeup was i played acoustic guitar uh brian gibson played cello he's a phenomenal cello player cellist um, Carmen sang and Matt played bass and, and, and guitar as well. So um, we would sit in kind of a semicircle and we'd sit there with these A&R people from every record label and play for them. And then they would tell us that we needed to go to New York and, and play for the, the big dogs in New York as it is. And so we, uh, we did that. And um, then that kind of, you know, went through to, we were playing in Clive Davis's office one day or in his, his like kind of performance, uh, room that he had adjacent to his office and that was surreal in and, of, in and of itself and we ended up signing with his label uh jrca and um that kind of set off a series of events that defined like the next three to four years of our lives where we um we were lucky enough that cameron crow got um got a hold of that that those same demo recordings and was interested in, in having us perform a song that his wife nancy wilson wrote for a, a movie called Elizabeth Town, it was the title track on it called "Same in Any Language." Um, we, uh, as we, it also set off like a really long recording experience where we recorded for probably the better part of like a year and a half or so, trying to get this first record done. But it it, it gave us a lot of really great experiences um, as far as being able to see a lot of really great engineers and producers in their element. Um, uh, so uh, did that. One of the one of the really great engineers that we met through the process was a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Kunkel, who had worked with with Lyle on a lot of his records all the way back to um, I think Road to Ensenada was maybe the first record. I, I, I might be mistaken. It might be even further back than that. But um, through Nathaniel, 
met Lyle one evening after a show in Los Angeles. Um, then we, we ended up kind of hitting it up from there. So, or hitting it off from there. So, yeah. Of all the things that you have done from composing, I saw your name on some of the songs performing. And then this, this other thing you do the the production of video of, of live events. Is there something that you find yourself the most passionate about? I had a, I had a moment in 2017 where my, the things that I was, was doing around technology were all encompassing. And it was what I would, I, I was really interested in pursuing that and going, you know, really taking it, taking it to the next level. And, um, but I felt like I was, uh, I was not, uh, I was not doing what I needed to do to, to treat the left side of the brain as much. Um, and so I started, you know, without any sort of, uh, without any sort of, uh, preconceived notion or expectations really started doing more music stuff with, with Carmen and Brian again, just to, to satisfy that kind of little bit more creative side. So I, I started realizing the, the, the importance of the balance between the two, um, because you, I feel burnt out on either. Um, whenever I was, whenever I was doing music the whole time, m music full time, I felt, um, in a different sort of way, burnt out on, on being engulfed in that side. Um, it's, it's a really rewarding and exciting kind of thing to record music and hear what's coming back over the speakers, but it's also not as like, and it's not a naturally structured lifestyle. Um, and in the world of like running a business and, and, you know, uh, having a lot that you have to do in a, in a minimal amount of time where, where you have to be structured. Like I found value in that too. Truth be told, like there's, there's, there's not as, I mean, like I said, there's not really as much, um, there's not much like recording something that you feel really great about and starting to hear it back coming over the speakers where it starts making sense. I think that that's like a really fulfilling thing, but at the same time too, there's, there's something to be said about, spending years on trying to to create a business and then start seeing it actually working um that's really rewarding as well so i there's there's a little bit of a balance in it but but um but yeah that's i guess that's that's my answer not answer <laughs> so you like the idea of weaving in and out of your more creative pursuits and then the more technology ended things exactly yeah hmm. yeah it, it helps me helps me feel like I'm not one dimensional in some sort of way, you know? So what is Lyle Lovett really like? <laughs> Lyle, Lyle's a, a, a great friend. Uh, he's, uh, he's very thoughtful. Um, he's, he, he has an appreciation for detail that is, is just really, uh, I think not, I think it's very lacking in a lot of what I see uh, at, at large sometimes in, in music nowadays. Like the, the he he spends a lot of time uh, just making sure that the, the things that he's 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 putting together uh, are of the absolute highest quality that he can possibly do. And it's as an artist and or as a as a you know musician and a technologist that's something that like i have great respect for and it uh it, it resonates a lot with me he's just like lyle's just a good a good guy you know he's 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 the same person that you see when he's talking to to uh, a guest online versus on the phone you know any time of day so he's uh he's very cool isn't he yeah yeah it's <laughs> It's another one of those things where sometimes it feels surreal that it's like, oh, Lyle's calling. Hey, Lyle, how's it going? You know, it's some, sometimes that feels surreal in and of itself, too. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> now, since you've been doing these live stream concerts with him, producing them, mm -hmm. there have been some really, really iconic people that he's joined, uh, that have joined Lyle Lovett. I'm hoping you can tell us about 
maybe a, a couple that have really they've they've really been thrilling for you gosh that's that's a that's actually a hard question um so um i really enjoyed um really in, in even this last show through willis i, I really enjoyed willis allen ramsey um, oh yeah he, he's just he's a really nice guy too and and just a really sweet sweet human and um and his music is just incredible as well it's it's one of those things where you feel like you feel like you know when you you listen to it like there's some sort of like you it all just kind of makes sense it all just it, it just sonically sounds great and um and melodically and, and and lyrically it's all just really great um and he in that so that one was was really fun i really liked um like the the jason isbel show was really great jason's a really nice guy um he's he's also kind of like a southeasterner like alabama uh athens kind of guy and so he he was really fun to to get to get to do a show with um and you know like um uh also the uh the vince gill show is really really a blast too and it's 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 crazy that there's been just i mean it like you said it's 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 a lot of really iconic people that have that have uh joined lyle on this show and um i, I definitely feel fortunate to be able to be involved with it and and help out where i can so the thing about these live streams is that they're so good. The quality of them is so exceptional. I I can't help but wonder, will you all con continue on with this? I mean, the the pandemic. We we all pray for the day when when things change for the better. But uh, do you do you see these continuing? Per perhaps maybe not as much, but yeah, I think I you know, I think that that's definitely the, the desire and, um, you know, how they might, uh, uh, look and feel moving forward as there's not as much of the restrictions through the pandemic, I, I presume could change, um, some based on, on what makes sense. But, but yeah, I, th I think, um, uh, I think there's, I, I think, you know, Lyle and I and, and, and everybody are really excited about each new one that we do and um, look forward to uh, actually kind of look forward to what it might actually look like in a year from now, post pandemic, when it's something where you could could visit with someone in person. I think that would be a, a neat way to kind of extend the show out. And, you know, the um, definitely excited about the, the next show here um, that got announced yesterday with Sarah McLaughlin. Um, that's going to be on April 30th. It's another one where, you know, Lyle sends an email and says, Hey, this is, we're going to, what do you think of doing a show with this one? Or this is going to be the next show that we'll do. And it's like, wow, okay, this is, it's amazing. It really is. Sarah McLaughlin, huh? Mm-hmm. Yep. That'll be a good one. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the, the reception so far just got announced yesterday, but the reception has been very, very positive out of the gate. So. Okay. So you see the potential for these live streams where perhaps if, if, if there's some kind of co-billing that's interesting, uh, it's not only live streaming, but also there are tickets sold and people are watching or sitting in an auditorium. Perhaps. I mean, ultimately my, my personal goal is to, um, and Sears kind of vision is breaking down any sort of barriers for artists to be able to have a direct connection with their, their, their fans and audience, um, making it where the, the complexity of being able to do things like these, um, from a technical or business standpoint, we just make as easy as possible. And, um, it ultimately comes down to the artist and what they want their voice and likeness to, to be and how they want to interact with their fans. Like that's, that's ultimately what we're focused on is helping serve the artist. So um, it'll, it'll ultimately come down to, you know, what, uh, what Lyle wants to do. Hmm. 
so what are, what other dreams what other what other things do you envision not necessarily just for seer perhaps seer but also just for yourself what do you what would you like to do hmm so I'm, i want to still create in whatever way i can whether it be through um through a business through a musical endeavor or through partnerships with people that i i just enjoy the time with um that's the, that always makes me feel the best is when I'm, I'm surrounded by people that I like and enjoy their time and I'm able to, to do something constructive with it that then we can, we can high five when we, when we do it. Um, I have like, you know, I, I, I'm somewhat neurotic, I guess, as far as like how I'll map out like, like quarterly and yearly goals on paths that I think are the important things to do at any point in time. But, but ultimately it kind of comes down to that is just being surrounded by people that, that I, I enjoy and doing things that we're all passionate about. What is the best thing about being Brian Whitman? Hmm. I feel like the best thing about being Brian Whitman is, uh, being able to, I feel, I feel very fortunate for having this like Neapolitan life experience where I've been able to do a couple of things with people that I've, that I respect. Um, you know, I'd be, I'd be, uh, I'd be an idiot to say that one of the people that I start, I'd be an idiot not to say one of the people that I started Seer with, um, is a gentleman by the name of Tim, Tim Moan who actually was a co-creator for HBO Go. So in the technology side of things, I've felt very blessed in the same sort of way on the musical side of being able to be around people that have, have always just been just overachievers and, and exceptional at, at their crafts. And that's what I think the best thing about my, my life is, is I can look around at like a group of, you know, 30, 40, 50 people that are all, business associates slash friends slash whatever and have like really a really solid um circle circle of uh encouragement and guidance and um i i don't take that for granted at all because it's it's um it's something when you grow up in a small town you start recognizing that difference of of ability to have access to people that that uh that give you really high quality opinions if that makes sense hmm. yes i always like to end the show i like to just give the guest the stage <laughs> and first of all anybody that's interested in finding out more about seer they can go to seer.la that's s-e-e-r dot l-a and uh what would you say to anybody who's tuned in with us, anybody who's watching or listening? I would say that the, I don't know if, 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 um, here, let me think how to, how to say this the best way. It, I think that being able to, um, being able to go through life with good friends and family and uh, having that support uh, support mechanism uh, is is one of the the most you know valuable things to to hold close to you and um, you know do do always kind of be open to trying something new and don't be cynical about it I feel like I feel like one thing is like I don't think I would be able to be doing what I'm doing if I was like just overly cynical I'm definitely a mm. lot more of like a sure let's try that that sounds interesting you know I'm I'm always open to to new ideas and and I think I think cynicism kills those kinds of things and so maybe that's it just don't, don't be cynical hmm. be, well spoken you know what I mean <laughs> I like it cool well Brian Whitman thank you so much for for giving me this interview I really appreciate the the chance to talk to you. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate you having me. I'm I'm like I said, I'm very uh, honored to honored to be be here. Well, until next time, maybe someday. I hope we can shake hands.
Definitely. Take care, Paul. All right. Thank <laughs> you.